Je donne à présent la parole à M. David Scherer. Monsieur David Chiré, vous avez la parole. OK. Mr. Mr. President and Council Members, I thank you for the opportunity once again to brief you. I'll start with an update on the political and security conditions and then touch on changes to the mission's operations in response to the evolving situation in South Sudan. Most critical right now, as we all know, is progress on the, peace, on the peace process. On the positive side, the transitional government continues to function and activities are progressing well within the, minute, the clusters of ministries headed by the five vice presidents. State governors have been appointed, which has dampened the tensions in the region. Uh, the exception is the historically volatile Upper Nile state, where a deadlock remains with the government unwilling to appoint the opposition's preferred candidate, General Johnson Ohlone. State ministerial positions were recently agreed, uh, but the county commissioners, which is the level below governors, are delayed by disagreements over the number of counties. Elsewhere, however, uh, the progress has been painfully slow. Cabinet meetings occur irregularly, and the South Sudanese want to see the president and vice presidents meeting and working collectively. There has been almost no movement on the critical area of security sector reform. Forces who have collected for training are yet to graduate, and many of those remaining are abandoning camps because of food and other shortages. Despite the urging of EGAD heads of state in July, the Transitional National Legislative Assembly is yet to be reconstituted. So necessary new laws are not being passed, and progress on the constitution has been delayed. COVID-19 has slowed implementation of the peace agreement, including meeting key benchmarks, but the pandemic is not entirely to blame. We are seeing a reversion to business as usual where progress on the peace agreement itself limps along. The continuing delays risk pushing elections out well beyond the timeline prescribed in the agreement. And that will add to the growing disillusionment amongst communities about whether the political will exists to give South Sudanese citizens the opportunity to choose their own leaders. Our experience has been that without significant international pressure, and regional pressure, in including that, political will does wane. So momentum is urgently needed, particularly to maintain confidence among the signatories. Mr. President, South Sudan is also facing other pressures, falling oil price prices, a continuing lack of financial accountability, delays in paying civil servants, and a near doubling in the street exchange rate since March is piling additional pressures on the government and families who are struggling to survive. With heavy rainfall recently and the Nile River at 60-year highs, Flooding has devastated the center of the country with 500,000 people affected, particularly in lakes and Jonglei states. Humanitarians are working incredibly hard to help people living without shelter, food, water, and sanitation in the middle of the rainy season. I'm sure Mark Lowcock is, uh, is, is going to touch on this in some detail. That work by humanitarians is not without costs. This year, seven aid workers have tragically lost their lives and another 144 have been evacuated because of subnational violence. This has meant an upturn in violence stemming from splintering between and within groups. The difference this year is that external political actors are fueling these local conflicts, conflicts with military advice and with heavy weapons. From January to July, unmisdocumented 575 incidents of subnational violence, an increase of 300% compared to the same period last year. In Jonglei State alone, 600 people were killed in six months, women and children were kidnapped, thousands fled their homes as they were looted and torched. 
The three communities, Nua, Mole, and Dinkas, were all victims, but all three communities are also guilty of carrying out crimes against the others. And while the situation has now calmed, tension remains high and every effort must be made to stop a resurgence. The government appointed a high-level committee on the Jonglé situation. And last week, UNMIS also organised the meeting with senior leaders to chart a way forward. We were encouraged by their willingness and the number of people who, in, who participated to, in, and to understand that the cost of going back to war is so devastating. UNMIS will provide political and logistical support to build peace in Jonglé, including peacekeepers to monitor buffer zones, increasing the capacity of police and help with infrastructure development. In central Equatoria, the NAS or the National Salvation Front has launched a series of politically motivated attacks. And despite claims that its actions are defensive, civilians and humanitarians are among the casualties of their ambushes. The heavy handed response of the government security forces has also taken its, uh, uh, taken its toll. All parties are signatory to the ceasefire and they should respect this commitment, stop fighting and pull back. In response to local appeals for help in the area, UNMIS deployed peacekeepers, but our troops were blocked by government forces despite our early agreements for the deployment. To point out for the past three weeks, the usual mechanisms through which UNMIS coordinates its movement has seriously deteriorated. COVID-19 can be partly blamed, but the influence of hardliners and the security forces is the principal obstacle. We continue to work cooperatively with the security forces, but we are impressing on the government that their restrictions on our ability to carry out our mandate are unacceptable. To avoid future confrontation, it is critical that this issue is resolved. Mr. President, the political violence of the past has largely subsided because, uh, despite delays to the peace agreement, as I outlined. The ceasefire holds and the unified transitional government is up and running. UNMIS is looking at this evolving situation and examining how it can better support peace and protect civilians. One area of change springs from last year's report to the Council on the future of civilian sites, protection of civilian sites, or POCs as they're known. As the report noted, external threats that led to the, the establishment of the POC sites no longer exist today. For example, the Juba POC site, just a few metres from where I'm sitting now, has become more of an outer suburb of the town. Residents move back and forth daily to attend schools and university to shop and to go to work. Therefore, in consultation with the government, with NGOs, donors and IDPs themselves, we have gradually withdrawn troops and police from static duties at the Boar and Well POC sites, and that's likely to occur in the remaining three other sites. The spike in subnational violence is occurring in remote areas, not near our POC sites. Therefore, we have to deploy our forces to provide protection where there is greatest need. For example, freeing up troops from Wow and Boar POCs have allowed us to redeploy our troops to hotspots like Tonj and Jongle, where people are in immediate danger. Following the gradual withdrawal of our peacekeepers, the PO sites, POC sites will then be redesignated and sovereign control over them will be with the South Sudanese government, not the UN. I want to be very clear, nobody will be pushed out or asked to leave when this transition occurs and humanitarian services will continue. South Sudanese police will be responsible for law and order. UNMOL, UNPOL works closely and has been working closely with them to build their capacity and in some areas will be co-locating with them. Responsibility must lie with the government to help its citizens to return home or find other land to settle. The government also holds primary responsibility for protecting their citizens and respecting the rights of those displaced, including those in POC sites. UNMIS, of course, will maintain its clear mandate to protect civilians and will intervene if necessary. 
with our need to respond to isolated outbreaks of fighting across the country that, is, that has emerged recently, our forces will need to be in the future more robust, nimble, and proactive. To do that, we are looking at innovative ways of deploying our troops to overcome the challenging environment, like more riverine patrols, rabbit air transport, and all-terrain vehicles. That doesn't mean more resources. In fact, without tying down large numbers of peacekeepers at POCs, we can be more effective with less. It's about working smarter with the right mix of troops and the right logistics. The foundations of this change are underway, including reconfiguring our military, police, and civilian components. And it's why we welcome the independent strategic review of UNMIS requested by the Security Council in March. It's an opportunity for us to review our mandate and implement better ways to meet the future demands of South Sudan more effectively and efficiently. No matter where people live and no matter who they are, all South Sudanese hope for peace and prosperity. And our job is to do everything we can to make that dream a reality. Thank you, Mr. President. Je remercie Monsieur Chirer de son exposé.